I wonder, do we use strategies to try and protect ourselves against the depth of meaning in the two great symbols of tonight's service? Washing of feet and celebrating the Last Supper. Feeling embarrassed about the idea of having our feet washed. No one else ever gets to touch my feet. Oh, I couldn't possibly. Or how we protect ourselves against the meaning of the Eucharist by arguing about its intricacies and what it might mean theologically. I mean, if we do try and protect ourselves against the depth of meaning in these two great signs, we wouldn't be alone. For generations, the church and the state have manipulated, mishandled, and even abandoned these two great acted parables freely. Now, I might get carted off to the Tower of London soon after saying this. And honoured though this cathedral was to host the royal Maundy visit, isn't it worth admitting that there's something a bit ironic about what medieval monarchs who used to wash the feet of the poor soon learned, which was that a bag of Maundy money was a far less messy way around the problem of what happened to dirty, dusty feet in the upstairs room. When Pope Francis and Archbishop Rowan reinstated the washing of feet at the Maundy Thursday Eucharist, they actually caused something of a stir in the Vatican and dramatically when Pope Francis washed feet first in a prison, then in a homeless shelter. And if we're really honest with each other, often, if and when observed in church, the washing of feet is done reluctantly, people having to be persuaded, cajoled, even coerced, and then it's a dab of cold water and a cursory wipe of a towel. Likewise, the church has fought over the Eucharist throughout its history. People have literally gone to the stake over its interpretation and how it should be observed. Go to the Martyr's Memorial outside this churchyard. At various stages, and this cathedral's architecture down the years would bear witness to this. The Eucharist has been elevated with bells, surrounded by incense, hidden from the people, and then at the Reformation, stripped of its ceremony, relegated to a bare table, and if you're lucky, three times a year before matins. And even today, people get hung up on the hows and the wherefores, how to go about it, how it should be done correctly. The shocking intimacy of what's being said. This is my body. This is my blood. And it is possible as well to allow overindulgence and sentimentality on the one hand and embarrassment and reluctance on the other hand to get in the way of what tonight is trying to do with us. If the truth be told, I wish we could all wash one another's feet. I wish we could use warm water, scented oils and towels. Maybe next year we'll work out a way of doing that. But just for tonight, is it worth remembering exactly in what context it is that Jesus enacts these two strange signs? Isn't it in an atmosphere of tension and confusion, of uncertainty and fear? Jesus has something of the utmost urgency to communicate. Literally hours before he's arrested and dragged away, he has one final thing to say to his disciples. And given their incomprehension, their confusion, their distress, he has to say it in a way that they will at least remember later when it's all over and done. So however you read the Gospels, it's fairly clear that Jesus knows that the hour of his death is likely to be fast approaching. That's why he came to Jerusalem. That's why he decided to walk straight into the hands of those who need to make an end of him. So if that's true, then somehow he seems to believe that his death is in some way necessary, essential even, that it's somehow the logical consequence of everything he's ever lived and taught, so that what he does at this final hour is also necessary, is also essential. 
So in a sense, what we enact tonight in this cathedral are the last gestures of a condemned man. His last will and testament acted out before his disciples. And if you think about it in that way, it sets in sharp contrast either self-indulgence or the preoccupation with getting it right and reluctance to participate. Perhaps the washing of feet and the blessing, breaking of bread and sharing of cup are all that he has left to say to them because words don't really work anymore. It's significant that from the end of the Last Supper, he says less and less, reduced almost to silence before the Sanhedrin and Pilate. So what he does at the Last Supper, he does with his body. The most powerful gestures come without words. What is it that he acts out with his own body? What is it that's so essential? I think it's nothing less than the making of a completely new relationship between humanity, the universe, and God. In kneeling to wash their feet, in giving them himself in bread and cup, what he's doing is trying to act out everything that he's tried to say and teach and live. The God that people used to believe in, the God who was out there, the God who was written on tablets or parchment, the tradition that has separated people into groups, good and bad, insiders and lost, is now, tonight, mirrored in a man who kneels to wash the feet of one who will in an hour betray him, the feet of one who will deny that he even knows him, the feet of ones who will run away and hide. That is the God, lived, indwelt, proclaimed by the man who now kneels at their feet. A God within all of us, irrespective of whether we respond or not. A God in the sheer silence of the human heart, who speaks not in thunder and lightning, but in lives changed. A God most powerful when most insignificant. A God most central when most marginal. A God most glorified when one human being kneels to serve another. There's no room for self-indulgence here. There's no room for reluctance. And Peter isn't let off the hook. And Judas, knowing what he knows, still has to have his feet washed, still has to receive the touch of love. And Jesus does not weep. It's too important for that. Surely as he breaks the bread, he must know, and know what they don't know, that the crack and tear of unleavened bread will be him the next day. The flow of wine will be him. No room for self-indulgence. No room for false piety. No room, in fact, for anything but our response. And what might that response look like? The great Anglican theologian John V. Taylor puts it better than I ever could. When the Son of God took on the form of a household slave, he lost nothing of his godlikeness, for that is God's role. Everyone who turns back to the kitchen when the guests have gone to begin the washing up is most like God in that moment. 
the anonymous cleaners who wake up in the small hours and walk the empty streets to clear up yesterday's mess in schools and offices have more of God in their action than the managing director. Like the patient sees, our creator has been cleaning up the mess in ceaseless, self-giving love from the beginning of time, for there's no one else who can do it. When you feel resentful, as we all do, over the chores of your inescapable service of other people, look again at the broken bread and the outpoured wine. And when, having given that service, you are hurt or angry because it was not acknowledged or was taken for granted, look upon the basin and the towel.